Hello, this is the G-Man of EAP because my opinion is just that interesting. I am a huge, huge fan of Spider-Man and I'm really excited to see where he's going to go now that he is part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. But the road for Spider-Man to get to this point has been an incredibly difficult one. First of all, I was on board big time when they announced that they were going to reboot the Spider-Man series. I know we get kind of tired of hearing over and over and over again that they're going to constantly reboot these series, but I thought this was a really, really cool idea because they were taking Peter Parker back to high school, uh, Gwen Stacy was going to be his girlfriend, and they were actually going to have the Lizard as the villain, which I guess they were trying to do in the old series, but they never got around to. It's also kind of cool when they announced that Emma Stone was going to be the love interest because, you know, she usually in movies had her hair like, you know, dyed red, but her natural hair color is blonde, so everybody's thinking, oh, she could be perfect for either Mary Jane or um, uh, Gwen Stacy. And while I like the first Amazing Spider-Man movie, it, 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 it is a botched, botched movie. The character stuff is really great. I love like like the the four main leads his aunt and uncle and the two of them which which really Peter and and Gwen's relationship is the best thing about both these movies because their chemistry is so strong because you know they're together in real life and that's really a driving force behind it but uh the casting of Sally Field I was just I was enamored with the problem was she didn't get to do a whole lot in that first movie but what's really frustrating about this movie is that they marketed it as the untold story, and then they are going to go back and kind of redo the origin story of Spider-Man. They modified it here and there to have, you know, kind of like a Ang Lee Hulk kind of thing where Peter Parker's dad experimented on himself, and that was a big part of why Peter reacted to the Spider-Venom the way he did. The problem is, the first movie leaves everything hanging in regards to that plot. The strangest thing about it is that Peter talks about his parents as if they just disappeared, not as if they're dead. And then he finds this news article that says, uh, Park, you know, Richard Parker dies in plane crash, and doesn't react to it at all. And while it's never been officially confirmed, there are a lot of deleted scenes in this movie that kind of built up to that bigger storyline about what Oscorp was doing, what, you know, how, 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 the way Peter became Spider-Man had a lot to do with the fact that his dad was essentially experimenting on himself and that he passed on that genetic information to Peter and that that's why, you know, anybody else who, who was bitten, if Gwen Stacy, like in the Spider-Verse, if Gwen Stacy was bitten by the the spider at Oscorp. She wouldn't have become Spider-Man. In fact, she might have even died. But it was the fact that Peter had that DNA in him. Which, I'm not a big fan of making Peter Parker's origin story and Peter Parker's family part of like a big conspiracy. Because part of the charm in, in characters like Spider-Man in, in Peter Parker is that he's a normal guy. He His parents weren't, you know, secret agents, even though it turns out that they were. He isn't he doesn't always have to be a super genius. He was just a smart kid who happened to be in the right place at the right time. And him being Spider-Man was the best thing for New York because he had, you know, this heart of gold and he had a strong will and all that jazz. But the way they were going to do it in these movies was pretty cool. But like I said, they completely left it hanging. It also has a, a problem that I'm noticing with a lot of like sci-fi comic book movies like this and like the Transformers movies have this problem where they stuff all the good action into the end. It has a case of what I would call uh, Dark of the Moon Syndrome where just all the good action is at the end. And while The Amazing Spider-Man is has good character stuff, it's got a good script, uh, the, the score I think is phenomenal, you come to a Spider-Man movie to see Peter Parker screwing up his love life and getting bogged down with schoolwork and Spider-Man swinging around New York stopping crime. And when most of the movie has no Spider-Man, you get kind of kind of antsy. I mean, what they easily could have done was have 
the part where he shows up on the bridge to save all those people, turn that into a fight. Because that's like the halfway point, and your audience isn't sitting around waiting for Spider-Man to punch a guy in the face, which I know seems juvenile, but that's part of the reason why you come to see superhero movies. If all of the Avengers was them sitting in the helicarrier talking about super politics, you would have been justifiably disappointed. But my problems with The Amazing Spider-Man stem more from just the fact that it doesn't have enough action. Like I said, it's botched. You can tell there's stuff missing. They kind of just let the, 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 the plot line about him finding his, uh, his uncle's killer, they just kind of let it go. Which, I mean, is kind of cool, um, because you're not... It's like, how, what is the likelihood of him finding this random tattooed guy in the, you know, the millions of people that live in New York. And it was a good, it was a very good element because like the conversation he has with Captain Stacy at, when he's invited to dinner, that's the moment when he goes from being a vigilante to a superhero. He realizes that he's just going after people because he's angry. He's not actually doing anything good for the city and with these powers. I also really loved that they gave him the web shooters again. I mean, I, I like the organic web shooters that Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man had that just came out of his hands because, you know, it, it it means that they didn't have to explain how in the world he, you know, uh, um, developed this web formula that would be super expensive to produce. Um, they kind of address it in this, but I don't know how he actually gets his hands on it. But it, it's cool because a big part of Spider-Man is naturally Peter Parker and the fact that he is a very resourceful and smart kid so to completely throw away his scientific intelligence the way they kind of did in the Raimi series even though I love that series it, it, it does a discredit to Peter Parker's character because in this he's much more resourceful he's much more proactive than he was in the other series and I really I really appreciate that about his character I also, I know people have a lot of qualms about it, but I really, really dig the suit in this movie because it actually looks like something um, you would make if you had a small budget. It still looks pretty expensive, but it's got like that weird, like football, uh, sorry, basketball material. Um, and they, they, they show that he, in fact, got it from online and kind of stitched it together from a bunch of different... Uh, one Piece latex suits, but when they announced the sequel, I was really excited to see how they would improve on it. I wanted to see what they would do with the costume. I wanted to see if they would actually fulfill the storyline. I wondered if there would be more Spider-Man action. For the most part, all my you know all my wants and needs came true because I honestly think that The Amazing Spider-Man Two is one of the best superhero movies ever. It is the most Spider-Man-y Spider-Man movie that they've made yet. It is one of the movies that feels most like the comic without having to digitally alter the video, like something like uh, like you know 300 and Sin City, which are beautiful films because it, it's it's beautiful to look at, the, like the colors and the fluidity of the motion. And in Spider-Man as a character that really works well in film because of the super cool things he can do, all the flips and the swinging, and the, the opening scene where he is swinging through the city is so beautiful. The way he moves, the animators really should get a lot of props for this, how he does that thing where he, he'll, he'll flip out and then he kind of like hand over hand climbs up the web to get to get height. It's so, it's so cool the fact that they've gotten to this point where he's not just putting out a web and then just going upward. I also love the costume. This is the best looking Spider-Man costume we've ever got in any of the movies. It does look a little bit like the Sam Raimi uh, Tobey Maguire costume, but it doesn't have those goofy fake muscle prints on it because Spider-Man is supposed to be a lean looking dude and, and you know, uh, uh, Andrew Garfield's in good shape, but he doesn't need to have muscle accentuation because he's supposed to be lean and strong to, to be able to do all the everything a spider can. I also love the, the, the big eyes that the costume has. And if they would have just taken the costume from the first movie and just given him the big eyes, because the eyes in the first movie, they were kind of mean looking. They were yellow and narrow and ugh. They, the, 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 the same problem with the first three movies is they had 
very mean looking eyes. Spider-Man, since you can't see his face, but since he's supposed to be, you know, the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man, he needs to have big friendly looking eyes and they nailed it in this. I am bugged that somehow he's able to store things somewhere on his costume, like a cell phone. I don't like Electro's character pre him becoming Electro. Um, I'm not that familiar with Electro in the vast mythology of Spider-Man. I know he's a, I know he's a criminal, um, but they went out of their way to try to. This seems to be a thing now, sometimes in comic book movies, where they gotta make him, you know, the super misunderstood and nerdy type, and he's not interesting. Even though they kind of have to, con they end up contrasting the psycho aspect of him with the with the nerd aspect. It just doesn't work because you don't really feel sorry for him because he turns up to be an asshole. I think Jamie Foxx did a good job with I, nailing what I'm betting that they wanted him to do, but he's just he's 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 super goofy, and I I also don't like. Huh, Tangent a bit. I don't like the way Hans Zimmer did like the, the 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 Max Dillon music. I love the Electro music, but like the Max Dillon music is really out of place sometimes. But once he turns on Electro, he's super cool. Love the costume. Love his powers. He doesn't seem too overpowered to fight Spider-Man, which is something I was really worried about. Even though he does electrocute Spider-Man like thirty times, and Spider-Man just doesn't die. And that's another cool thing. Like I mentioned about the Amazing Spider-Man, Spider-Man. Peter actually does some science stuff in this, ha trying to magnetize his web shooter so he can fight Electro, and granted, Gwen ends up helping him. Uh, it's him being proactive, it's him taking steps to combat this character. It's not just him getting into endless fistfights with the character. And, back up, that's another cool thing about these movies, is that Gwen Stacy is never the damsel under stress. Okay, okay, the, at the very end of the second one, technically. But in the first one, when she gets cornered by the lizard, the lizard doesn't give a shit about her. He just takes what he needs, the, the Denali device or whatever, and leaves. And so it's cool because she's almost like his sidekick. Naturally, she doesn't have nearly as big a part as he does because the movie's called Spider-Man. But it's cool to have a female lead who is the love interest, who is not always in distress, and like the hero, is very proactive. Very cool. I really appreciate that about these movies. And this, this movie... While it is kind of boshed like the first one, you still get a sense about what this movie is supposed to be about. It's about time. It's about loss. It starts with a shot inside his dad's watch, and it feels like a an entire story arc of like a comic. Like you, you like you've read. Oh, 20 or so issues of a story arc, and that's what it feels like, because there's all these beats and moments, and these highs and these lows, and all these different storylines. It's a lot to take in, but it's a lot to take in like, and I know this is always going to be the analogy to make, but it's a lot to take in like The Dark Knight. A lot happens in this movie because it's a big, big story. It could have been chopped. A lot of it was chopped, and it made the movie not work. Now, I want to address that, the fact that this movie was like the first one, had the main focal point of the plot, well, not the main focal point, but a big part of it edited out. A lot like Daredevil, there's a scene at the beginning of the movie, and there's no, uh, you know, if you've seen the movie you know this, and if you haven't, I don't give a shit, where Peter's parents are in that plane, they get attacked by that agent, I guess who's working for Oscorp, and his parents allegedly die. Now there's a deleted scene that is on the Blu-ray, and I think the DVD too, where Richard Parker comes to Peter. And when I first heard about that, I was pissed off. I'm like, you can't do that. You can't retcon something like that. He obviously died. That's a huge part of, the, of, 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 of Peter Parker's origin story is having his parents die. That'd be like having Uncle Ben come back, which I'm, I'm pretty sure they just did in the comics, but I don't know because I haven't been reading them. What the hell is going on here? But then I watched it. I watched the scene. And if you haven't seen it, watch it. It's a very, very good scene. It's very well acted. It's very well written. It's really cool because in the first movie, Uncle Ben mentions 
that there is something that his father used to say, and he essentially paraphrases the great power, great responsibility thing. And then in this scene, Richard Parker actually says the line. And then he goes on to tell Peter that what he's doing is good and he's got to keep doing this because people need him or else he essentially says Gwen died in vain, which is cool because in the movie it kind of feels a little bit like Peter was just kind of like, what the hell, bye Gwen, too bad you're dead, I'm going to go fight crime, and kind of forgets about her. And this was the definitive little push that Peter needed to get back into the swing of things, pun intended. Okay, I guess I should probably talk about the rhino and the whole thing about the rhino pretty much not being in the movie. He's in the movie less than Venom was in Spider-Man 3, which is... <laughs> can't even believe it. But it's kind of cool because he kind of bookends the movie. He's regular Russian dude, mobster, gangster, killer dude at the beginning, and then he becomes super villain, robot, dino suit man at the end. And it... it bookends the the movie in kind of a cool way. I, I They shouldn't have advertised him as a villain, period. They shouldn't have put him on posters. They should not have put him in any of the trailers. Him showing up should have been a complete surprise, because then when it showed up, people wouldn't have been expecting uh, this big fight with him. Now, I knew that there wasn't going to be a fight. I knew that that was going to be the end of the movie, so I I was more open to the idea, and I liked that idea. But it didn't work for a lot of people, and I get that. And I know the death of Gwen didn't work for a lot of people, too. The death is I, is one of the strongest things about the movie, because their relationship is so great, and you care so much about both of them. Right after the final battle with Electro, he's, he's getting really frustrated with her. He's telling her that he's not playing around, that she needs to get out of here. And, and you know what's coming, and it's, it's, it's like that suspense versus surprise thing where you know she's gonna die. So I, I just, I don't get why people don't like this. It is one of the most accurate comic book movies with regards to getting the character's tone and what people like about them and the stories spot on even just the look of it. Now the Harry Osborn thing is kind of weird because while I like, f for starters, I like the costume, they should have given him a cape and hood because he kind of just now looks like a mutant Billy Idol in like a destroyed Batman suit. But like Wolverine, we all have to admit you can't pull off the Green Goblin live action looking like the way he does in the comics. You need to do something. Don't give him a Power Ranger suit necessarily with a mask that doesn't move, but take some cues from like Ultimate Spider-Man where he's kind of like a Hulk thing. He doesn't have to be the Hulk like he is in Ultimate Spider-Man, but that it's a deformity thing. That's where the face comes from, so it doesn't have to be a mask. And then like they do in the Ultimates, just give him like a hood. So you got the, you got the, the purple mix of the green and then you got all the gadgets. Okay, so that's my rant, review, kind of overview of the Amazing Spider-Man movies. Next, I want to talk about the direction I thought that they should have gone and the direction that I think they're going to end up going now that he is part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Stay tuned.